Good morning, good afternoon, good evening and good night. This is the Red Report. Who knows when you're watching this in the land of YouTube. I am Chris Ridyard. Alongside me, my partner in crime, not in crime. Sorry, Carlo. I've told back. you, I've told you. It leads to problems. <laughs> right? And working in youth justice and crime, I've already got six DBS checks. So that's just co-presenter, -co call it. <laughs> Carlo van der Rotterin. Also, doing? Carlo, a nice guest at this time. Former yes. Barnsley FC captain and now currently i might get your job title wrong are you head of academy at someone athletic is that right paul yeah i get called all kinds especially behind my back but yeah <laughs> uh in, char in charge of the academy at sunderland yeah so academy manager academy director head of academy anything you like so a very similar role to the guest we've just had on which is, which was bobby assel yeah um myself and bobby uh still speak pretty regular i uh, spoke to him a couple of days ago actually uh we did a, a master's degree together quite recently so we've, uh, we've kept in touch uh, quite a lot uh, it's great to have someone in, in that position as well that you can bounce ideas off in a similar uh, environment to me I think he was still doing his dissertation today wasn't he he said yeah doing it he was obviously. He's, he's, he's been yeah. doing it quite quite a bit there's an awful lot of work that goes into it uh, but it's, it's, it's been good like to I spent my head for a long time just battering into centre forward so it's nice to actually use it to, to learn something and actually educate myself <laughs> yeah and obviously having somebody like that a friend a colleague who's tried and tested while you're going through a similar part a similar journey together that must be nice yeah definitely uh, there's no getting away from the fact that however mentally resilient I think I am it's tough leaving football it, I mean it's, it's quite well documented at, at the moment and and it's not one that I want people to get the, the violins out for because there's certainly people, especially at this present time, that are in uh, worse situations. But yeah, it's, it's tough. Like it, and it, it is nice to have someone alongside you to kind of support you and, uh, and be a sounding board. Of course. I love your accent, by the way. And, and you're a very quick talker, which means we're going to cover loads of ground. This episode. <laughs> Unless Carl asks a question and it could take 20 minutes, anything can happen. I'll get me caught. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, would you like me to put the stats up? And we, yes, we can please. Talk, let's we can talk it's, all through them. Let's start Paul, at the beginning. Paul, it's the best way. Let's start at the beginning. It's the best place to start. Let's have a look. See if I can work this computer of mine. Well, you've had 10 weeks, so you should be able Here to. Here we go. Look at this. Oh, e have a look. That's We've it. We've got those. Yeah. Um, yeah. Courtesy of Barnsley FC stats. Paul, what do you think to that? Yeah. Are they good, aren't they? They're nice stats. Yeah. Um... Obviously, just wish, wish there was more, especially uh, more appearances, uh, goals. I was never prolific, and I was that, that's a thing right throughout my career that I've, I've scored more. But I yes, like that's, a, uh, good ratio, that's, 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 that's your average ratio, I would say. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'm being too uh, self critical, but yeah, like I. I always think of the ones that got away, the, the ones that I uh, escaped the marker and, sh and should have probably scored a non more so than the, uh, the playoff final. Of course, I, I yeah. Had a, I, had a, yeah. I had a header later on that we can probably talk about later that I should have scored. <laughs> Carl, do you want to read them out just for the... Because uh, obviously this goes out on podcast version as well. Uh, yeah, so Paul Reid appearance is 128, seven goals, debuted the 3rd of August 2004 versus MK Dons, a 1-1 draw. Uh, first goal, 3rd of August 2004 in that same match, still a draw. And the final appearance, the 22nd of September 2007 uh, versus Southampton, a match that we won 3-2. 
And um, Paul, you, you talked about you know the missed opportunities, but um, growing up then as a as a lad, who who did you want yeah. to become? You know, I, I, he'll mention it later. Obviously, I'm Dutch. Um, I've, I've never had the physique to be a football player, um, but for me, um, people like um, Frank Rijkaard, Marco van Basten, Ruud Gullit, they were on my wall purely because I knew I'd never be like them, but they were my idols. I'd like to see them play. Who was that for you? Who do you take inspiration from? Yeah, probably a few surprising names considering the position I played and the type of player I was. Uh, so I'm, I'm from Carlisle, so... Uh, Peter Baisley was one because Peter Baisley uh, played for Carlisle at uh, uh, an early stage in his career and my me, oh. me dad liked him and at them, at them time we had like uh, VHS videos and uh, I remember having a Peter Baisley one because my dad liked him so I remember watching that. <laughs> uh, the other straight, strange one is a, and a very strange one uh, straight from left field is a, a Roberto Baggio uh, and, right. and, and, I'll, and I'll tell you why it's, and it's a, a typical uh, child's perspective is I found out he's born on the same day as me, the 18th of February. Yeah. And uh, as, uh. as soon as I found that out, that was like, oh my god, like he, he's the one. He, he's the one I want. I want to be like. Uh, yeah. I've been I've been called a lot of things in my time, but never Roberto Baggio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you, Chris? Do you, Chris, do you share a birthday with anybody famous? Uh, no, I don't, bro. Yeah, I possibly do, but I can't. I can't recall it. I do share a birthday with a, a bloke I used to work with. He's a joiner, so yeah, he's not. <laughs> He's not my hero. He's not okay. my hero. <laughs> he, he, he's, he's telling everyone else that he's got the same birthday as you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I share my birthday with Sting. And, he, you know, he plays football like I do, and I sing probably not as good as what he Oh, does. is that the police <laughs> thing, or, or are you on about the wrestler? Which one is it? Sting. I know I'm on that, the, the, the lead singer of the police. The lead singer. Do you yeah. want to sing a bit before we carry on, Carl? No, 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 no. I want to know. I want to, I want to know. Um, always football for you. Paul, was it always football? Yeah. Were there other sports? Yeah, North. I think. Uh, I think today. I think uh, certainly with, within our academy, and I, and I see my, uh, my young daughter at school, they get far more exposure to different sports, and they get to taste different things and uh, and have a look at maybe what what suits them. Mine was football, and it, it was the only thing I was really introduced to. And, and as soon as I like got introduced to it, re really got a, a taste for it, and, and that was me. I think the same as a lot of young lads. I always wanted to be a footballer. I, 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 my mum's got school reports from I've been six, seven, eight, and me saying I'm going to be a footballer. Uh, I remember having arguments with career advisors at secondary school when you're 12, 13, 14, me saying, I'm going to be a footballer. That's what I'm going to be. And they're like, yeah, but what are you really going to do? I'm like, no, I'm telling you, I'm going to be a footballer. Uh, yeah. Wow. So it, 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 was always, it was always that for me. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that have got to fall into place to be that. Uh, and there's an awful lot of people that wanted the same dream and, and didn't quite make it. Uh, so I consider myself very fortunate to have had that dream and uh, possibly not got to the level that people aspire to, uh, Premier League and stuff, but can sit back and say, I gave it a right go and, and had a good time. So you've decided, you're in the careers office, you've decided you're going to be a footballer. Obviously, we, we, we are the Barnsley podcast, so we're going to talk about Barnsley. But just fill that gap in for us. How did you get from the careers office to Barnsley? Fill that gap in for us, Paul. M1. Yeah. Um, so, uh, 14, 15, 16, I was, I was, I was doing really well. I had, a, I had a few clubs interested in me. Went across to Newcastle, nearly signed for them. Uh, ended up signing at Carlisle, my hometown club. I ended up signing a, a seven-year professional deal when I was 16. Wow. Um, they, they really thought something of me at the time. So, ar around 15, 16, and my parents actually kept it from me. They, they knew that I was going to be offered that kind of contract, but they wanted to keep it away from me. So I stuck in at my GCSEs. Yeah. Uh, but, and, and, that, and that was my kind of first platform. When, when in a car, things were falling to plan. I was getting to the first team at 17. Uh, two games ish for Carlisle at, at 17, 18. And I can tell you now, I've never strung 20 odd games. As went right I was absolutely buzzing playing for my hometown I was I was young I was enthusiastic I was confident just everything I touched like even sometimes I, I didn't even mean it and, it and it was like coming off and I had a, a lot of scouts watching me uh, and that summer uh, I had a few people interested in me went to Singapore with Leeds United I was going to sign for them and then the end I, I ended up at Glasgow Rangers uh, was, was there for 
three, four years. Didn't work out. I couldn't break into the first team because they were so strong at the time. Came back down to England uh, and then had a, a career back down in England. Brilliant. Brilliant. Carlo? Yeah, obviously, like like Chris says, we we are we are the uh, Barnsley FC podcast, so we want to talk about your your time with the Reds. Um, a stat yeah. that I found today, um, the two thousand and five season, Andy Ritchie uh, appointed you as club captain. Uh, yeah. You missed five weeks of the start because you picked up a ham, hamstring injury, um, and obviously yeah. that then hinders you your playing. Um, during that season, uh, seven yellow cards and two reds. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Good stats, these Carl. I'm uh, stringing. <laughs> for the people that don't look, I, mean, I, I, I've, I've watched you. Was that part of your game? Big, physical, no nonsense. No, I think uh, competitive. Like I, I certainly didn't go out to to try and be an enforcer. I don't think I was that. No. I just may, maybe naive sometimes that when I've seen a ball that was maybe sixty forty against me, I'd go, I'm, I'm going for that. And yeah. I, sometimes I get it. Sometimes I'd, I'd get hurt trying to get it. Sometimes I'd clatter into somebody else trying to get it. But it was never anything. Me trying to be the big man and trying to really prove anything. It was just I just wanted the ball. Just if I saw it, I went for it. And, and, yeah, uh, nothing malicious. Like, off, just off, off, often that worked, and, and and sometimes it didn't. And that oh. that there is why we 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 try and find players that that we could talk to like yourselves because. Whenever you put that shirt on, it was 90 minutes and you never held back. I don't think you ever came off the pitch thinking, I could have done more because you could just see. And that team, especially when you had your, you know, your, your Bobby Hassels and you, it was literally 100%, wasn't it? Everything was left on the pitch. And then it was sort of back in the changing room, ready for the next match in a couple of days. That, that's very much your outlook, wasn't it? You gave everything you could onto the next match. No nonsense, just... And I think that's why he's a legend. That's why you talk about certain players from certain... We spoke to Bobby Assel. He's, he's played with 150-odd players. But your name came up and some other name came up because you were very alike. It's, it's about hard work. It's about being honest. And, and very much a fan's favourite. Yeah, it's, it's very kind of uh, people of Barnes and yourself to say things like that because I had such a connection with the players and, and still do. Uh, and I, I always felt that, like, I, I don't claim to be the world's best player. Like, Barnes have had some, some like, fantastic players, especially, uh, like, the the era that you're in the Premier League. So, fantastic players like, like Red Ferns and Hignett and, and the like. Uh, but, yeah, I, I can sit back and say, I tell you what, I gave it everything I had. The, the, there is no game that I thought, yeah, I could have done more there. And, and that, that's probably why... I, I picked up uh, occasional yellow cards, red cards, occasionally why I got injured because there was no, there was no holding back. I, no. I, I went for it and uh, like I said, sometimes that worked, some, sometimes it didn't, but I always knew that right, I've, I've had a right go there and whoever played against me, I would like to think whether they got the better of me or, or didn't, then they knew they'd been in the game. Yeah, of course. You mentioned a few of you, Carl mentioned Bobby Assel there, just pulled the team up. I don't know if you can see yeah. that, Paul. Yeah, I can see any, it, yeah. any thoughts there, just looking at that team? There's some characters there, isn't there? Some some really good lads, some intelligent players, but it's definitely a mix, isn't it? It's quite an eclectic mix. Yeah, there's some uh, obviously good players and, and some good lads. And it's it's what carried us through. I'm sure everybody you, you speak to uh, around that time will say about team spirit and, and how well we all got on, probably to the point that you're you're bored of hearing it and, and want a different answer. But the, the truth is that that is what it was. Uh, whether it was by luck or design, you had a group of lads that genuinely all got on. Like, uh, we pushed each other. Like, don't get us wrong, in training, it, it certainly wasn't a jolly up. It, it's one of those when you play against your friends, like even in, in training, you want to beat them. Like, I know, I know Andy K was on the other day. Me and, me and Ant are great friends. We, we still speak. But I tell you what, we didn't have, have some scraps in training. And, and whoever was refereeing, they were in for it as well because <laughs> both of us would be shouting and swearing and claiming for every decision. And <laughs> if the ball was out, we'd both say it wasn't. And, and it, was, it was just like that. And I think the group that we had were good lads, decent players, all got on. We didn't need to be bogged down with the, the strategy and the culture and, and everything else around that and the, the kind of long term plan. It was always have fun, be fit, and you give it everything you've got on a Saturday. Of course. It, it, was, it was almost like everything else just takes care of itself. If we can just keep doing that, repeat that, repeat that, repeat that, then hopefully you do all right at the end of it. 
Of course, you mentioned managers there. You've played under three, did you, at Barnsley? I've got Hart, Richie yeah. and Davey. Um, yeah. Just how, how, just talking about them three, really, and how they differed and what you liked about them. Was there anything you disliked about them? Or what, what, did they just like the team be the team, like you say? Yeah, uh, Paul Hart, I, I personally got on really well with him. Uh, I, he could be quite intense. I think by his own admission, he could, he could be quite intense. He could be quite dour at times. Uh, I, I got on great with him. I, I really uh, liked him. I, I actually haven't seen him since since he left, when it, when it was announced that he left. Uh, myself and Bobby and a few other lads actually went down to Nottingham uh, for, a, for a drink with him uh, just to say thank you and, and goodbye. That was the kind yeah. of uh, stay we held him in. Uh, he got some really good players in the building. I think that he probably doesn't get the credit he deserves for getting a lot of those players in uh, that ultimately got us a bit of success. Uh, I think he was unlucky that it was a bit of a rebuilding job at the time and the new players didn't quite gel the way uh, we possibly hoped. Uh, and, and Andy and, and Rick and the staff kind of took that on and added to it and, uh, and got some success out of it. Uh, what, did, what, did, what did Andy and Rich, Richie add to that? What did they bring that just took you that little bit further? Possibly a bit more of a relaxed attitude. I, th I think... Again, like I say, I got on really, really well with Paul Hart. I truly did. I think some of the players did feel a bit under pressure, a bit under scrutiny sometimes because it, it, it could be quite demanding. Like I say, I, I didn't mind that. I truly didn't. Uh, but some, some players like felt it was a, a little bit on edge, a little bit anxious at times. Uh, Andy and Rick came in and it was completely the opposite. Very, very open dialogue. Uh, very much a collaboration. And it was... It wasn't uh, authoritarian. It was very much we liked them, so you wanted to do the best for them. Like if if you didn't do your best for them, you you felt like you were letting them down, like like almost like you would uh, a father or, or or something like that. That's yeah. that's the kind of way we, we seen them. Like so, when they said they were disappointed in you, it really hurt. It it was like I, I don't want you to feel that because I genuinely like it. Uh, Those were the managers. What about your players, though? We asked this um, Anthony Kay and. Um, uh, Hugo Colacci as well. If if you could uh, put together a five-a-side team of the players you played with at Barnsley, so players who were yeah. then obviously at their peak, what who yeah. was the most skillful? Who was the fastest? What what five would you pick for a five-a-side team? Yeah, it'd be it'd be tough. I'd, I'd, I'd need a bit of time to think about it. Like a couple that immediately spring to mind: uh, Chopra, I'd, I'd have up front, uh, just a goal scorer. Just at, at that time where we were stuttering a little bit and were struggling to gel. He he came in and even though he was he was young at the time and uh, we only had him on loan and he was absolutely bonkers as a lad, uh, ab absolute uh, crackers, full of enthusiasm. On on the pitch, he just had that little bit extra. Just any, any time the ball was there, like he, he, I wouldn't have said he was a great kind of worker, like into channels or in, or great hold up really, but just anything in the box, just touch to the side and shoot. You you always backed him to think he, he's got a goal in his locker. Uh, the other obvious standout for me would be McPhail. Um, I, th I think we were lucky to get him at the time uh, and lucky that he was such a good lad because he had such a good pedigree and background. And to me, he was better than us all. But he, it never came across that way. He was never arrogant about it. There was no ego about him. He was just one of the lads and just and just mucked in. Uh, those were the two obvious ones. Uh, I'd probably get uh, some consistency around them. P people like, like you mentioned there, like a, a Bobby Hassel or Anthony Kay, you, you wouldn't go miss with either of those two. Like uh, Very consistent. And I know, I know Bobby and Dan are held in high regard, but honestly, playing, playing alongside them, Possibly not enough. Honestly, the good players. Uh, like I, I play centre half with Ant, and just his basics really good. Like uh, clearing the ball with both feet and uh, positional play. I think I think I know, I know he played in midfield a little bit more uh, after he left Barnsley as well. But he had more in his locker than just a play centre half. He, 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 had, he had a bit of ability. So he, yeah, and and he was very intelligent uh, as well. I mean, we spoke to um, well, Anthony. Hey, and, and very much an underrated player. I thought one of the most underrated players we've had when we looked at um, the other clubs where he's gone, you know, three promotions to the championship. Yeah. Player of... Play. I've, I've always thought that if, if, if somebody gets an accolade like, you know, um, player of the year by the fans, it, yeah. it, it says, you know, it says something. Um, <clears throat> just while we're waiting for Chris to reconnect because he sets it up and then leaves us. Um, your current job. Um, 
Yeah. Put, putting COVID-19 aside, uh, we spoke to Jim O'Brien a couple of weeks ago, who was doing some hours at the Barnsley Academy, obviously coaching as well. Yeah. Uh, we spoke to Bobby Hassel. It's hard, isn't it? You're working with um, a, a huge bunch of talented youngsters and in, in real term, in real money, a very small percentage will probably go on to make it into the, the, you know, the big time. Um, yeah. How much has it changed from the academy, from when you started and you were playing to obviously the professional setup where, where you're working now? How, how much has changed in that? Uh, I would say there's absolutely no comparison. I, it, I, I, would, I, would, I would almost treat it as a different sport. It's totally, totally different. When, when I came through playing, we were training for uh, twice a week for an hour. And uh, it was at Cala United. It was at School of Excellence back then. Uh, a lot of small-sided games. I don't remember a lot of uh, tactical sessions or certainly wasn't any analysis or any kind of game intelligence sessions. Just, uh, I don't remember anything around nutrition. Uh, don't, don't remember ever using a gym or, or doing any sport, uh, sports conditioning or strength conditioning. I uh, don't remember any flexibility. Nothing. No, nothing. We, ju we just played. And, uh, and you, ca you kind of learn as you went along. Trial and error. Now, it's all singing, all dancing. It's such a, a holistic program that you've, you've got you've got an element of everything. Uh, there's no stone left unturned. We're, we've got uh, player care officers to make sure that the the well being and uh, and focus can be on football. There's a head of education to make sure that uh, they've got that provision. Uh, strength and conditioning coaches, analysts, psychologists, coaches. Uh, everything they could want, basically, and it's it's a, it's a challenge for us to make sure that they appreciate it because they're coming to the building, especially a, a great place like the Academy of Light, and I've got all this kind of support, and it's it's making sure that they appreciate it and and understand that it's not like this everywhere else. That they're, they're fortunate to have it, and it, it, that's two way almost, isn't it? Because you're very privileged to put that Sunderland shirt on. I mean, we know, we've seen the documentary, we know how passionate people are in the North East, obviously, about their football. But it's also really, it's a key time, isn't it, in, in these youngsters, just development as people. I mean, Chris works in a, in, in, a, in a secondary school. I work in youth justice. We often see the negative side of, of, of young people, behaviour-wise, or obviously in trouble. Um, there is a huge job, as now almost on academies on, yes, it's, it's about football, and it's about... Um, you said it's sports coaches, diet, everything else, but it's also about shaping human beings that, if they don't make it into football, can sort of contribute positively to society, isn't it? Massively. Uh, we've got uh, three things that we say to academy parents before the uh, young uh, boy comes in the building, and that's we can guarantee one of three things, either that we develop them enough that they play for Sunderland first team, which is the priority, what everyone else wants. Yeah. We give them enough footballing knowledge that they're going to have a career somewhere else and, uh, and, and have, have a good career in the game. Or we give them enough transferable skills that they uh, transfer into another vocation seamlessly. Yeah, I, think, yeah. I think if we can do that, if we can say we will guarantee you one of those three things, then I think from a duty of care aspect, we, well, I, I can certainly sleep easy at night to say that I know you're entrusting me with your most valuable thing, your, your, your son at, 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 this, at this time. So I think it, Certainly, me being a parent now, if, if, if those were one of the three options I was given, I think, OK, uh, I can accept that. And I know that not everyone can be a footballer, but at least it's not kind of that all or nothing mentality that if you're not a footballer, then you're, you're on the scrap heap. Yeah. Chris, okay. you're back. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry about that. It's <laughs> this uh, love upon doing internet you know, with Aldi and that. It's, it's difficult. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what I've missed there, but obviously I'm, I'm talking about your, your yeah. football now. Did we cover how you managed to get that role? And, and did you always want to do that? Is that something that you went on to study as soon as you retired? Or had you already got it in your head that that was going to happen? Yeah, I think, uh, I think as everyone probably does when, the, when they finish football, there is a period of, of reflection on what direction do I want to take. I knew that I always wanted a strategic leadership role within sport, but that's quite a, a broad subject. That's yeah. really me for I stopped. Uh, I sought to upskill myself, so I, I did a, a postgraduate diploma with the Johan Cruyff Institute. I did a, a qualification with the Sports Business Institute of Barcelona. I went and did a, a master's degree at the University of Salford. Wow. All all around sports business, uh, neuroscience, and 
and understanding how to lead and, and how to shape an organization around uh, vision and culture. That, that, that was always my passion as a, as a, as a captain in dressing rooms. You, you're, without realizing it, you're doing that. You're, you're influencing people and it's understanding why certain people are receptive to certain language. What, we, do, we do it every day, but everyone does it every day. Like you're always selling something. You're, uh, oh. Which movie do you want to watch? This one or this one? And, and you'll make a case for the one you want to see. And, and it's just, just the same with it within the work environment. And, and it was the same with me in dress rooms. You knew that you had to speak to certain people differently. Some needed an arm around the shoulder. Some needed a rocket. And it's, it's, it's just the same. And that's what fascinates me, that, that how to deal with people and how to shape an organization much more so than... So I, I can... I, and I do observe training and I can uh, step in and, and give maybe technical points. But my passion isn't coaching as such on, on, the, on the training ground. That's, that's never what I wanted to be. It was always that kind of overarching view of, of an organisation, which is what I've got now, very fortunately. And I don't want to divert too much because I know Chris has got loads more questions, but when you talk about steering an organisation, just not too quickly, but during the pandemic we're living in, COVID-19, um, football clubs are businesses, people are employed, but there's also, in your case, an academy with lots and lots and lots of youngsters um, do you have to deal, or, or are you seeing more sort of um, almost like mentoring, humanitarian uh, roles at the moment, just supporting? Because it, it must be, really, for us it's hard because we moan that we can't go to the football. But actually for these young people that have given, you know, a full season in an academy hoping to get another contract, how has that impacted the situation? How, how has that impacted the club, but also the, the young people at your academy? Massively. I think uh, even adults and, and staff and myself you, you struggle with the lack of structure so you can only imagine what it's doing to the young people across the academy and and that's what we're really focusing on the the well-being and uh and safety of of, of the youngsters so we've, we've got a uh, the club value that i put in place is together in the pursuit of excellence and right now all we're focusing on is the together like so but there's a there's a small number of staff that aren't furloughed within the academy. We're making individual phone calls to every academy parent and player to, to connect individually and engage and make sure that they're okay. If there's any issues, we're here to support them, whether that be physical, education, uh, help around structuring the day, anything basically. Uh, we're doing group Zoom calls with all the age groups to just get them talking to each other and, and keep that social side going on uh staff as well like this this week i've wrote uh thinking of you cards to every member of staff within the academy with a personal note in it just to let them know that i genuinely care and it's not a gimmick it's not oh this will score me a a point down the line it's a a gen i genuinely care about them and i I want them to know that there's a a saying uh no one cares what you know until they know that you care and and i i I live by that a lot and and i wanted to make sure that they genuinely know that 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 is true I, i do care about them yeah, you speak so passionately, and we can feel it emanating, yeah. Paul. We're not just saying that. You can feel it coming off of you. And when you talked about your study and everything that you've put into to get in the role, I can, I can really tell it meant a lot to you, and you really seem to be enjoying it. I'm glad with that. You seem, is it your perfect job at minute? It's not going to get much better than that, is it? Surely. You're, must, you're loving oh, it. Oh, f- fantastic role. Fantastic. Like I said, something that I always wanted to do, and, and I'm very fortunate that I've got the opportunity. I've, I've been in the role two years now. It was actually the... Uh, to your anniversary last week, uh, achieved a lot in the two years. There's certainly been a change in the two years. I certainly think that the the setup's better than when when I walked in. But a lot, a lot more to do. If I, if I was still in the role in three, four, five years time, I, I couldn't see me coming stagnant because it, it is such a all encompassing role. Football's come such a long way in just a short period of time. It's changed so much from from when you would have been a youngster. Um, and it's become so much more professionalised, not just on the pitch, but with every little bit that's behind it. It's so meticulous. Yeah, um, that's the bit you missed, Chris. That's the bit we spoke about. <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah, 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 best yeah. bit as well. <laughs> best, it usually, it's best bit when I'm not talking. Um, I, I, we'll take a trip down memory lane, Paul. I'll, I'll pull up a few photographs for you, and we'll we'll, yeah. we'll try and evoke some memories for you. And then, and then we'll... oh, don't tell me you're into the man there. Oh, easier. <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not. You keep saying that Come and on. then you're like, ah. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Like I said, it must be that Aldi internet that I've got. <laughs> Let's have a look at that. There we go. <laughs> Just talk about those photos and pause. So that's, 
So that's, is that your first season? Is that going into into starting your first season there? Yeah, at Carlisle, I think I think that's I think that's a picture I got taken when I signed professional. I think it was my seventeenth birthday. I think uh, so. I, I signed I signed the contract just as soon as I left school, and then I did uh, six months on the on the YTS scheme, and then in February, which was my seventeenth birthday, I, I, I started on that seven year pro, and I think that was the picture that, that, that got took on that day. Have you still got that shirt? Because that is a lovely shirt, by the way. And I'm not a man of blue, Paul. I won't wear blue. <laughs> I just bought two. I just bought two pair, new pair of football boots for next season because uh, I play Sunday league football, obviously. Um, and and I would not have a, a boot that's got blue on it. Have, have you still got that shirt somewhere? Is, is that is that framed? I, I must I must have it somewhere, and I'll have to try it on see if I've grown into it now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really nice shirt, and that, and then just talk about the other one. We talked to uh, Martin about the other photo. Um, yeah. And he obviously went on to his, uh, I think he went on to his stag do or something. It was the wedding yeah. week later and he, he's obviously come back there and he's, he's looking a little bit worse for wear. What did your celebrations look like there, Paul? So we, obviously, we win the game at the Millennium Stadium. We we get on the bus, we, we stop off at uh, Tesco's, I think it was, and just emptied Tesco's and just got a load of beer on the bus and obviously singing, partying all the way back into Barnsley. And we, we were conscious of that, that we didn't want to stay down there. If, if we won, we wanted to be back in Barnsley, celebrating with everyone. And if we lost, we obviously just wanted to go back home. Uh, so we, we get back to Barnsley and you, I th we probably underestimated what it meant to the town. Like we, we go back to Barnsley and we're thinking, all right, the, lad, the lads will go out and we'll have, we'll have a drink. We didn't realise the whole of Barnsley would be out as well. <laughs> it, was, it was absolutely crazy. Uh, we went out. I still had my club tracksuit on, uh, whatever night that was. And then I think I was still in the club tracksuit a day or two later, and, and I was still out. And I, uh, we were still celebrating. And then that uh, again, I hadn't been promoted before, so we got told we we're having this uh, civic reception in, at the town hall, and we're going on on a bus parade. And again, I, I didn't I didn't understand that how big it was. I, I, I in actual fact, I'd been on the drink for probably three days. I'd had enough. I'd had enough. I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to go back. I, wanted, I was going to go back to Carlisle. I was actually going to skip it and go, I'm going to go back to Carlisle. Like, I've had enough. I just need to go home now. Uh, and the lads were like, no, no, no. Like, I didn't have any clothes. That T-shirt you see me with on there is uh, Brian Howard's. Because I didn't have any clothes. Really? Uh, I, <laughs> that is I, a good story. I, I just... Uh, What's I that going like? Is that, is, that, is that a phone call, a text message, or... Or is it just a panic, Brian? I ain't, I ain't got a top. I don't know where my top is. Or what? Oh no, there's no, there's no, there's no panic. It was, it was, it was like, hey, Brian, I need a top, and it just got, just got one slung at me, and just like, yeah, I'll put that on. Uh, <laughs> and it, it, even then, we, we go, we go around on the bus, and like, we didn't have any beers or anything. We we're like, well, is it going to be like a big thing or not? Are we just going to like go around on this bus? So, so it was me that went down to, uh, I can't remember where, where it was down the, where the roundabout is down, down the bottom, and went, oh, I get, I get a lot of beers from there. So I went and got some, and we're just talking gesture, having a, having a couple of beers before the bus left. Honestly, we get on the bus, and there's thousands of people on the streets, and, and we're like, "Oh my god, this is unbelievable!" Yeah. And then we, we get to the to the actual uh, town hall, and we didn't really see everyone uh, congregating in the middle. We just obviously go in the town hall, and then you get up on the balcony and see everyone. You're like, "Wow, yeah, wow!" Nice. Like, so from going from three days on the drink, I've had enough. I'm going home. It's we are going again. This is unbelievable. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Get yes. me a beer now. And yes. I think Barnsley, often when people say Barnsley, or Barnsley, and you know, it's the black sheep. If you look at Yorkshire and some of the, and they are the bigger teams. But I think, um, maybe not to that level, but I think the North East and especially South Yorkshire, people enjoy the football because often that's the only good thing about where it is where you live. Don't get me wrong, I've been here 30 years. I love Barnsley. I live here. But it's that, that's what I miss most at the moment. But it's when you can, you know, when you get promoted, you go, everybody's just, everybody lives for the Saturday, don't they? Because sometimes when times are bad and there's redundancies, the economy is bad and Brexit and everything else, but at least there's football. At least as a community, you put that shirt on and you can go behind do it. You, I think that's very do you simple. think, Paul, that's why you enjoyed your time at Barnley so much? Do you see a lot of similarities from, from where, you, where you were brought up and, 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 and the, the passion? And, and cities that rely on that football team, and it brings is quite a togetherness. Do you think that's that's why you enjoyed it so much at Barnsley? Yeah, I think obviously the it was a combination of things for me. It was kind of the, the perfect storm. There was a good group of lads. I enjoyed playing under like uh, Paul Hart and uh, Andy Ritchie. 
uh, we had some success uh, and just felt an affinity with the, the kind of people just because, I, like, like we spoke about earlier, my, my approach to football was give it everything you've got. And I think yeah. even, even when results didn't go well or maybe I didn't play so well, people could say, I tell you what, you give it, give it everything you had. And there was yeah. kind of that, uh, there, there was always that kind of uh, respect between us that like, yeah, it didn't go well today, but pe- people appreciated that, yeah, but you're doing all you can. And I think that's all oh. anybody ever asked of you. Uh, and, oh. and, I, and I could buy, in, I could buy into that. I, I gave it ep- absolutely everything I had, and and people bought into it because they could see I was doing it. I, I, I was generally doing what they probably wanted to do, just to be on the on the pitch, play for Barnsley, and know what it meant to have the shirt, to know what it meant that this isn't a jolly up, this isn't this this is a privilege. This is a privilege yeah. to be on the pitch and playing for Barnsley, and and I, and I I like to think that I I treat it like that when I when I play. Of course. I think, and I think, in perfect fairness, I think that's how you're remembered. Um, me, me, and Chris will have uh, telephone conversations <clears throat> and say, "Who should we try and get on next?" And I go, "And that's my mate." And obviously, we've, we've got a list. Barnsley's had loads of players, and that's what they always will be. Just players who put the shirt on and they they played for us, and they've gone. And when you now contact them, they're too busy or whatever. And I think, especially, and I don't know, maybe it was that era, maybe it was the management. I don't know. But when we asked Brian Howard, when we asked yourself, when we asked. Um, you know, Bobby Hassel, and it's like, yeah, no problem. And I think for a lot of people, I mean, that night when you were at the town hall where you're at Wigan, that's when I went to the wrong house. I was that drunk, I forgot we moved five months <laughs> previous because <laughs> that's what it meant to me, you know. Chris, that's brilliant. Yeah, I, I remember crying, I, I just I just cried, and I, I was a teenager at the time, I think, what would I be like, 14 or something? And I just cried I, as soon as the whistle went, we won. We won the penalties and you see you all running from the halfway line. I just cried. And I, we went to Bridlington the day after with my dad in the car. Uh, and we just, we had it on radio all the way there. All the way there. Went to, because my family were there already. And uh, we drew, we, and it was just Barnsley, everything. I think my dad bought like five different newspapers. Just so on the way I'm reading every paper to him. And it was just, it's just so emotional. Just unbelievable. Is that your favourite memory? Being a Barnsley player? It, it can't be beaten, can it? Surely. No, I had, I had uh, some good good memories. Uh, I've said previously that the semi final was was up there for me as well. Uh, of course, to, of course. To, to go into the second leg one nil down. Um, the score. That that them scored uh, me me score uh, in in front of uh, the fans. Uh, my mum was there and friends were there. Like and, and to win the game that that was that was good. That that was yeah. really good. Uh, the final's the, the big one. Uh, other other memorable ones. Uh, I. We we played Stoke away on Sky and won one nil in the championship. I got man of the match. That was a big one. That was one of those ones where you felt yeah. you yeah. go to Stoke, you win one nil. I think Stan scored, and I got man of the match and I did well. And you think I tell you what, that's proper. That's proper football. I've gone toe to toe with a good yeah. team, some good players, and we've won there. That that Come felt good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Beat beating Leeds three two at home. Yeah. I remember that's always that, good. That was big. <laughs> That, that was big. I remember, nice. remember that. Yeah. Again, it was just a, a big club like Leeds come to our place. You think, right? There you go. I've have some of that. We've we've beaten, sent you up, sent you up the road. Like th- th- that felt that felt good. Uh, but lo- lots of good times. Obviously, that that season and the and the end of that season is, is obviously the standout. Time is running out. Sorry, Chris. Yeah, I'll hand over. Time, time is running out. I just want, I just want to say before I hand over to Chris. Um, Football's very uncertain at the moment. I know, obviously, Championship, but Barnsley in a very precarious position. Um, who knows? Our paths as clubs may cross next season. Um, but I do hope that football gets back and you can go back to doing what you love best. And uh, you're very much still very highly regarded with the fans. So it's been an absolute honour talking to you. Very kind of you to say. Thank you. Yeah, Paul, thank you very much for your time. Just a few quick fire questions. We've literally got one minute left. OK. Quickest, quickest player you've played with, the quickest Quickest. Um, Kyle Reid was quick. Kyle very Reed, quick. slowest, slowest player. <laughs> um, other than myself, uh, Barry Conlon. I don't think he was, be- he was Conlon, winning it, yeah, any races. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hardest player you've played with. Toughest. Hardest. Uh, um, I give him a go. Answer tough lad. He like that. He like that. And we liked Terry Anthony. He was a good guest. Yeah. Just like yourself, yeah. you've been a brilliant guest, Paul. Thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. Please come back on at some point in the future. We'd we love to hear from you. and love to hear how your journey's progressing. 
good luck with that and uh, we'll speak soon thank you very much Cheers, brilliant Paul. have a good evening yeah. guys